All right, let's get started. And if there are more people that pop in here, I will um, bring them in as I see them pop on. So today we are very lucky to have Steve Olson, who is actually one of our panel appraisers. So when we do appraisers for your clients, we have about, um, <clears throat> gosh, at this point, seven different people that we rotate through. And Steve has been one of those folks for probably 14 years at this point that we have worked together. Does that sound insatiably long? It does sound insatiably long. Okay. Um, so Steve is definitely one of those folks that when we have questions, we go to him. I feel like over the years, he has taught Jenny and I how to actually look at an appraisal, how to look at if the adjustments are out of whack, how to look at why you know, pulling that comp from the other side of the road <clears throat> is not is not a good use because the family that's going to buy on that side of the road is not going to be the family that wants to buy on the other side of the road. Like there's all of these crazy things. Um, and so we bring him on today, just number one, to do some question and answer for you guys. So hopefully you've got a few um, that are just burning questions that you want to ask a live appraiser that does this every single day for multiple entities. Um, two, I would say be kind. I know that appraisers sometimes cannot be your favorite people lately because they give you answers that you don't like. So therefore you see Steve as a real human. So be kind. And, and I um, have gray hair, Lisa. What's that? I have gray hair. If people want to let loose, then that's okay. fine. We'll, we'll go through it. Oh Nobody yeah. Be kind. We have definitely had our share of, uh, of clients over the years. Um, so, and the reason that we did this, obviously, appraisals are the hottest topic. We have got a crazy market out there. You guys already know this. You're making multiple offers. You guys are getting frustrated. Um, and just know that when we're doing this, we don't take it lightly either. We are in it with you guys because we've got to then call the listing agents. We've got to write pre-approvals. We've got to redo numbers every single time your clients make offers. So I promise you that we will do everything that we can to have them get their offer accepted. That is our job to do whatever we can to make them stand out, be different um, from the 20 other offers that they get. But um, so with that introduction, with all of that, I've worked for Steve or worked with Steve for 14 years. He's excellent at what he does. And I just think it's so good for you guys to kind of hear what their challenges are at this point and what they're seeing in this market. So Steve, I will start out with the number one question um, that I have at least on my list, which is kind of knowing this market right now, knowing that there's been you know, sometimes 20, 25 offers on a property, knowing that it started out a list price and it went up here. How are you approaching these properties knowing that this market is really fluid and it's moving? And what is your biggest challenge with appraising properties at this point, knowing the lack of inventory? Well, that is the biggest challenge is, is the lack of inventory. You know, we're human, appraisers are human. We understand how the dynamics of what's happening with these offers and multiple offers. You know, I haven't been doing this for 28 years and the markets have always changed. We've seen bad markets, we've seen good markets, great markets. And this is actually the first time in 28 years that we're actually seeing this type of market. Not, it's a spring market, but usually the spring market in the the rapidly increasing prices have always been kind of res, you know, restricted to that lower end entry level home. And that's not the case now. They're kind of happening. Uh, I can't say I've had a multi-million dollar multiple offer situation, but you know, several hundred thousand dollars into the into the mill range, it is happening. Um, and that's that's different. That's different than it ever has been. Um, and what has not changed in those 28 years is how the appraisal process still works. We don't get any kind of special permission from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac that, hey, we're in a, we're in a, a, a low, low supply, high demand uh, environment. You guys can go ahead and do things this way. No, we are still restricted to the way the system has always worked, providing comparables. Um, they have to be sold comparables. We cannot, we can, 
put um, pendings into an appraisal, but we don't always, many times we can't even get the, the, the actual answer and what that pending property is pending at. Um, we see them now, we see something that's pended at 350. You know, chances are that thing being at 400 is pretty good, um, but we don't always get that number. And if we were provided that number, it not sure how helpful it can be because we can't wait. We can't provide weight and say, hey, our, our sales say this, but our pending properties say this. Um, therefore, we're going to push it up. We have to develop that appraisal with the closed sales. And hopefully, yes, they're the most recent closed sales showing the most recent pricing structure. Um, and then we will make time adjustments. Obviously, if things were three months old or six months old, if that market has gone up, many have, we can statistically get that information off the MLS system and apply time adjustments. But when things go rapid, really quick, you know, our, our stats are through probably March 31st. So what's happened in April is not of record yet in terms of the direction we're going. We assume it's going up, of course, by all everything we're feeling. Um, but just know there's always gonna be that lag um am i babbling there lisa oh, no, no that was good um i have a question about the time adjustments yes so when you take data off mls and uh do you is it for a zip code and this is just my ignorance on this and maybe <clears throat> the agents know this but do you take it from like this neighborhood or this area that you're pulling comps from and if that area is up three percent would you then be able to make an adjustment for that in how you're coming to the value of the property? Yeah, you know, everybody can just um, chime in. I just wanna hear a yes. If anybody, are they able to chime in? Yeah, you guys are able to talk. I have nobody muted. You just all mute yourselves. So if you wanna talk, unmute, please. Otherwise, if you wanted two questions in the chat box, you certainly can do that, and I will make sure that we answer those. But yeah, go. You, all of you can unmute, no problem. Okay, I just wanted to know if anybody uses within the MLS system the InfoSparks app within MLS. Not yeah. that you would need to, but I'm just wondering, kind of knowing what to mention and where I get this information from. So I'm going to. I'm going to assume there isn't much, many response. Of no, that. I, mean, I look at it. I look at it sometimes, but I don't okay. necessarily always use it. Well, it, it it's a good source, and it's a link within the MLS system there, and it's it's called InfoSparks. And so, so Lisa, to answer your question, is let's say I'm in I'm in um, South Minneapolis, and I'm in Linden Hills. I can look specifically within InfoSparks. I can make a map around Linden Hills, or if I want to incorporate Fulton, the neighborhood Fulton, you can, and in these neighborhoods don't matter in the big scheme of things. Just understand that you can look wherever your subject is and define what your marketing area is. And you can, you can put a square around that area. You can put a radius around that area. You can freehand it to say, oh, geez, south of 50th street. I don't want anything down there. You can you, you can make whatever your location marketing area is, whatever you want it to be, it can be, then you can take the stats from that area. And then the other part of your question, Lisa, is if the whole area went up 3%, do we apply a 3% adjustment? Mm -hmm. No, would okay. not necessarily. If, if I'm in Linden Hills and I'm at a $1.5 million level, and then I just do everything in Linden Hills and say, hey, what did the pricing structure, how did the pricing structure change in the last 12 months? If you include everything, you may end up adjusting a million and a half dollar property way too much one direction or another. Um, so we should narrow it down. Like if we're a 2000 square foot, two story home built in 1940, and it's around a $600,000 price point, I'm going into InfoSparks, defining my neighborhood, and putting in properties that are 20, 25% bigger, 20, 25% smaller, um, basement, kind of bracketing everything, you know, where you have a little bit more 
size, a little less size, maybe bigger site. Well, you can't do that in info sparks. Um, age, um, I guess there's lake. There's all these different ways you can separate these out, but in price. So I don't want to know what a 200,000, well, it's not a $200,000 home in Linden Hills, but I don't want to know what that low end is, nor do I want to know what that that 1.5 to $2 million range is. If I'm in a $600,000 range, I'm going to look maybe down to 400,000 and maybe up to 800,000 and see what that market is doing. And I'm going to guarantee you, you will come up with completely, completely different numbers than if you would go, you know, under 500 or over 1.5 million. So you do have to kind of choose where, what price level your house is at, how big it is, um, and then go into InfoSparks and it will separate things out. It will give you the average selling price, the median selling price, um, average selling price per square foot and median selling price per square foot. So you have four, four sets of data points. And when the market's going up, all four of those are gonna be going up. Sometimes a couple of those might come down. The other ones might be going up. We might have a stable market there. So there's different ways of, you have to, you have to reconcile or you know, read what the statistics say, but that is how we come up with that, that number. So if I'm on Lake Minnetonka and I've got a $500,000 teardown house, I am not looking at what the pricing structure of two and $3 million homes are doing because that's irrelevant to the, what I'm doing. So it's just know your market and, what is going on like in big picture, the whole metro area? No, there's no statistics that I would use for the whole metro area and to apply that to a subject property. You have to be a little bit more detailed because what might be happening in Linden Hills and South Minneapolis may not be the same thing that's happening in North Minneapolis. It's Minneapolis, but school yeah. districts might be the same. But, you know, again, that InfoSparks is a fascinating tool to to work through and that that will give you a lot of knowledge and understanding of what to expect you know during the offer period or what we're going to accept or maybe what is in store for us on the appraisal process because if we all think those numbers are going up exponentially at you know 10 percent a month we go in those statistics they might be saying they're going up one percent a month um going through March 29th, probably at this point. So does that answer that, Lisa? Yeah, I just, when you said that 3%, it just automatically makes me think like, okay, well, if I have a sold comp from, you know, February and my market's increasing by 3%, can I add 3% to the value of my house? No, you cannot, is the answer. Mm, you know, it, it, yeah, I can't say no, you can't, but right. you should. It it's should be a little valuable. bit, yeah, a little bit more, logic into it. Um, uh, you want to be able to compare your segment of the market. And, you know, let's say, hey, things went up 12%. Um, and then an adjustment, we would take 12% divided by 12 months. Okay, what is it? 1% 1, 1 a month. Then I'll look at the, uh, the comparable and it says it closed August 30th. I'm not going to go back to August 30th. I'm going to look at when that comp went off market. It might have been a June 1st. Mm -hmm. sale and that's that's reflective you know that that's two months so i'm going to do everything possible to to eke out as much uh time and it used to be years ago time adjustments even lenders did not like them because they could not be supported they're supported they're one of the easiest things to support um in in terms of adjustments so i'm not a you know and sometimes even in these markets if we have a comp that's 12 months old you would think, let's ignore it because it's 12 months ago. It might be the best comp and it actually might support the highest adjustment or the highest value. So I don't always think that I'm going to throw that out because it's 12 months ago. I'm going to look at it and say, everything about this house is perfect. And 12 months ago, if that house could sell at that, ours should sell demonstrably more and let's time adjust it. So sometimes people are kind of focused on only using the newest yeah. But yet, if we have a reliable way of making that adjustment, we can look at something older if it makes sense. If it's the best comparable, but it's nine months ago, I'm still considering using it. Now, if we're, you know, again, falling short, if it's the appraisal is potentially coming in low, yeah, I'm looking at that. Did I do the right thing? Is there something better? Is there is, is a comp that sold two weeks ago, that just closed. Is that better than something that closed 10 months ago? 
does it show us a higher price? Not concerned with it showing higher. I can't, I can't, I can't say I want to use this because it's higher. Um, I have to use it because it's the smarter comp, it's the more realistic comp, it's the it's the best supported comp. And so not always is that the most recent, but yet we want to balance that report. We want to show, we don't want to send an appraisal out with all these time adjustments, with every comp having a time adjustment, not the greatest plan. So we do balance it. So a couple of quick questions on that debt stem and agents feel free to buzz in and ask questions. But honestly, this, this time with Steve is, um, is just as informative to me because I and or Jenny really is the go-between between between the appraisers and you guys when you when you're battling and giving us new comps. So the more we understand, the more we can be objective and guide you when you're when you're doing this stuff. Steve, is there anything that's cut and dried about time? Like you said, a comp that's a year old. My gut instinct is like that's too old and dismiss it. But is there anything that's cut and dried that says any comp over a year is simply not accurate? or is vary by price point? Not hard, not hard. It's not a hard rule. A lot of lenders, it, it, but when a lender would see that, an underwriting process would see that, why are we using a comparable from 12 months ago? It does depend. I mean, it, it, if we have a, if we're in Bloomington and we're dealing with a, what were they, Oren Thompson rectangular, 24 foot by 40 foot home, there are thousands of them. You know, yeah. why are we using a comp that's 12 months old? I mean, there, there will be hundreds of comparables. So it does depend if it's a lakefront on Lake Minnetonka, you know, using older data. And you know what? We can go longer than, than one year um, if it's making sense. Now, if there's a lot newer stuff and we don't want to use them because of the price, yeah, that's, that's different. Okay. You know, but it, it's a matter of what will provide a, a balanced and supported appraisal. And like I say, I'm not, I don't fear using something that even in an inflationary period that is, you know, pushing a year old, if it's doing something, if it, if it is the next door neighbor and it's the same design and there's so many things about it that's similar and shoot, it's 12 months ago. Again, we can get a very good understanding of the market based on statistics um, about what that adjustment should be for time. So again, you know, if I'm working with an earth sheltered concrete dome home, okay, I'm using comps Nobody that might be dome homes, by the way. Nobody does those. You find one out oh. there, no one finances them. So no dome homes. Let's not. Earth let's homes, not whatever you call them. Them. And keep um, We had one of those. That's why you're referencing it. I know it. Been a nice earth sheltered concrete dome home. That means I'm looking at things two years ago, three years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at things maybe 50 miles away. So Again, the, in appraising, there's not hard, fast rules. The, the question is, if we're expanding everything, are we ignoring the things that we shouldn't be ignoring? That's different. You know, a dome home that's in Minnetonka versus one that's in my, uh, White Bear Lake, that's probably pretty legitimate to say, hey, we're going to go to the other side of the city and grab something. We need to show that this type of home does sell, they exist, and this is what that one sold for. So the, it, it's fluid, it's yeah. fluid. Um, but what's not fluid is to use comparables where we chose them because of the price. You know, where I can't, I, I would never appraise something where, hey, it sold for 500, was listed for 450, sold for 500, and I put 500, 450 to $550 into my 55,000, or 450,000 to 550,000 into my, scope of comparables I want to look at. Uh-uh. I'm looking at everything. Price will never be part of that search. We have to figure out what the market will pay. So I'm not putting a price in there. And I'll look through there. And that's when the red flags come up saying, why is everything under 400? And we have something here at 475. It starts to make us aware. We have to be aware. Um, and to go back to your comment about how, how much time is spent on, on things that are troublesome in terms of the values. Yeah, you work harder, the agent works harder, the appraiser works harder. <laughs> Everybody's working harder on these things and it's much easier to come into the value that it's sold at. But if it's not there, we, we have to be able to demonstrate it. 
So you made a comment that I want to touch on, and I'm not putting you on the spot at all, but you say you're looking for things and you don't necessarily put a price on it, but it's what some, it, what is someone willing to pay for it? What is the market willing to pay for it? Right. So then. Are, are you talking about like a, a feature about the house? No, or, I'm talking about. Or, or the about house itself. People, no, I'm talking about like what, when we are looking at these properties and people are willing to pay X, you know, does that come into play? I mean, uh, this person's not on here, so I'll say it. But I did have an agent that said to me the other day, well, there were 22 offers on the property. How can this not appraise? Well, the, I, yeah, I guess the so question is- there's 22 people that are willing to raise their hand and go, I will pay that much for that house. And then what happens on these, these um, bids, you know, generally the highest bid is what, what's accepted. Um, and if you get 20, because my neighbor just sold two and they, they priced it, but you guys are crazy. I knew what they were doing and they got, they got 17 offers. Now the question is, is of those 17, in terms of market value, is market value is defined by what the most probable selling price is, not what the highest one is. Does that matter to me? You know, it's in the back of your head. It's that voice in the back of your head going, you know what? We'll, we'll do this. Market value is what the most probable selling price is. And then when we have a, a situation like this where, yeah, we have multiple offers, you put 22 people out there and everybody's going to offer something different. Chances are not all of those. They might have been 22 different offers and it might have been a big range, but most likely the highest or the close to the highest one was accepted. I'm not concerned with that, but does it does it play a role that we've had multiple offers and it's sold in a day, I can definitely look at all of those things. It's just when it comes down to that final reconciliation, where this comes into value, it can't play a role. I mean, that just makes me look at it differently. I'll put mm -hmm. the file down. I'll look at comps differently. I'll come back to it. I'll be talking to the agents and just doing more of the due diligence. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's probably more time spent um, when I'm seeing that, hey, this thing looks like this might get a little dicey. Let's see if there's another way of looking at it. Is there something else about this house that other comparables didn't have and this one has? So you're looking for everything. Was it the floor plan? You know, was it three bedrooms up, one on the main level versus four up? You're, you're looking at every everything where you can start forcing yourself to look at comparables differently and say, okay, I need to look at, this might be a salient feature that maybe I've missed. Let's go look at what's available with this particular layout. Um, so yeah, it does play a role. It, it, it you know, makes me, you know, you got to do your due diligence, but again, it, it, it can't be where the numbers say 500,000, but yet the sales price was 550. If it's not there, we've got to have something there that would support that $550,000 sales price. Got it. Not concerned with, what things were listed for either. I can totally see that, that because I've, I've actually appraised many that actually came in higher than the list price in this market. But there are some that are just a little off. <laughs> okay. I think someone wanted to ask a question. Go ahead, whoever that was, Lexi. I do. Yes, can I stem off Lisa's question? So multiple offers. I like to attach the offers when I send a note to the appraiser. And let's say we have 10 offers and they're all 20 over list price. Yep. How much weight does that have? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, cause some of them aren't going to be, but I, for example, I had a property 20 offers. There were a couple that were only 10 above list. The rest were 25,000 to 30,000 above list. And so I sent a, you know, the first page and the fifth page, all of those offers to the appraiser and the comps that we use to create our base price. So aren't I Perfect. saying, here's, here's our value, here's where we started and why, and now the market is telling us it's $30,000 higher than what sold in the last six to 12 months. Shouldn't that be enough? You know, you're not gonna like the answer. I know, I know, I can see it on your face. <laughs> I was gonna just add something to that too. And to that point, what if you have like a handful where um, 
they're they're going to cover the gap in some way by like five to 20 grand. I wonder, does that even matter? You know, yeah, I mean, appraisers are human. So can an appraiser be swayed? The bottom line, the appraiser is tasked with determining the value based on the closed sales. And if there is a big gap and that those high level sales, closed sales don't exist, that's where the trouble kind of comes to a front there. It, it, there's nothing there we can see. We all understand why we got there, but the lenders are not going to accept an appraisal when I say, hey, I'm basing these on listings and, clo and uh, pendings. It, 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 it won't go through. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac won't, won't allow those things. Um, uh, lending appraisals do not rely on there. Sometimes there's you know, forecasting. Sometimes um, a relocation, if any one of you guys do uh, relocation appraisals, um, there's, there's a way in relocation appraisals that allow the appraiser to forecast what's going to happen in the future. That's different. They're not, they're not lending money on this, but they're trying to figure out in 60 days what is the value of that property. That's not allowed in, in lending appraising. Um, we have to show it with closed sales. Um, but with that said, you know, yeah, I'm human. I, you know, the more information I provided, I love getting comps from agents. If there's a bunch of uh, sales contracts, offers um, that were not accepted, it's hard to say that it's helpful, but I like them. It's not like I take this information and throw it away. And it's just more information and okay. And then I'll look at what else was available. Um, you know, looking at all these people who made the offer, what else is around there? Yeah, there is no other listings. These folks all wanted to buy the same house and I totally get it. Just, we have to have the closed sales. It's just the way the industry works. Um, they, they don't allow the appraiser to extrapolate a future value. Like, hey, this is what it will be after the April closings happen. No, there's, it doesn't, it can't happen. Okay. Lexi, did that answer for you? I think so. And I think you were right. I don't love the answer, but I guess the bottom line is I always thought the value is what somebody is willing to pay for it. So you price or you list appropriately, but if we have five to 10 people who are willing to pay $30,000 above, it doesn't sound like that actually makes a difference until other and comparable have sold at that price, which really exactly a tricky position right now in this yeah. market, because we know all these, we've been out there, we've lost on the other side when we're representing buyers, seeing stuff go $50,000 above list. So that's where you need to be, but then it's not going to appraise, even though the value is there now. And then these buyers are having to come up with that cash to bridge the gap. Right. So it, it's just stinky, but yes, that does. Thank you. Okay. So well, another uh, oh, good, th or thought I had, because I know that, yes, the, how market value is obviously what somebody is usually willing to pay. The other part of that is that, you know, people don't pay taxes on their market value of their home too. So technically, I don't, I'm, I don't know, I was just in tax mode here, but, um, so you know, we, I know. Last half full, thank you. I, I get, I know what you're saying, like the taxes is value is yeah. lower, so. I don't know, just another thought. I was like, oh, that makes sense that the, you know, you don't actually want the appraised value to be, you know, <laughs> the market, yeah, you know will, unless you want to. For people, um, and, yeah. you know, I think the, the common denominator too, I think a lot of times people think, well, market value is what somebody is willing to pay. Um, and that's not the definition of market value. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac have a definition of market value that's actually put into each report and I don't have one nice and handy here, um, but it, it, it's the most probable selling price. It is not the highest. It's not what one person will play, pay. It's what is the most probable price. And does that really play a role in how I do my job every day? No, it, 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 it's there because we've been trained that, hey, that's market value. It's not one person's value. It's market value, what uh, the most probable selling price. But yet I get it. And it's not that we hold back because, well, that's just one person. This is we just have to demonstrate, you know, that, and that, that's even wrong. That's not my job. It's not the appraiser's job to demonstrate the selling price. It's to determine what the most probable in a balanced market, too. It's not a balanced market. 
and everybody knows that things skyrocket when we have a limited market, just like it's going to happen if we go the other direction too. <laughs> and we're, we'll have the opposite effects too. The appraisals coming in, well, yeah, get off well, base. One caveat to that is I know that we've talked many times and as we go in spring, we always talk about this is that data lags. So sometimes, mm -hmm. and even now that's accurate and that's normal because, you know, people who are buying in January and February are different than spring buyers. It just is sometimes, maybe not in this market, Stephen, certainly correct me, but data lags. And so the other point is, is when I am talking to your clients, I'm having that conversation because sometimes they're like, we don't want to pay more for a house than it's valued at. And I said, first of all, an appraisal is data. And a lot of times if it's coming in a little bit less, it's because more importantly, the data is lagging and the data hasn't caught up to what your property is closing on. So that leads me to one other question. And again, again, you guys have questions, let me know. Otherwise I have a bunch of them and I'll just keep asking. Um, one of the things, Steve, that I wanted to know was if you do an appraisal and let's say it's a 60 day close time and uh, let's say you did the appraisal March 15th, but it doesn't, our property doesn't close until um, like April 30th. Is there something where if you know that there's a pending or something like that, can you come back two weeks later and amend the appraisal because now you have got a new comparable that will change the value of that property or because the day you went out and the day that you pulled data and you then submitted the appraisal, are, are we stuck or do you have some options there? Definitely have options. If there is that new data exists, it's reasonable to increase the, the uh, relook at the appraisal. And there's some technical things that have to happen is we, we would have to update our appraisal. We might have to drive by the house again, say, hey, the house still sits there. My new date that I've seen the house is this date mm -hmm. because you can't have the appraisal, you can't have the comp close after the effective date of the appraisal. So we just have to go back out and the appraisal date. so. And, and, and this is the way yeah, I think good appraisers understand the market. If we know, hey, we're two months out on closing and we're having something that's low come in here, I will be talking to the client. I will be making a call to your team, Lisa, and say, mm -hmm. hey, there are three there are three pending properties. The agents did share the selling prices with me. There's legitimate evidence that in 30 days, this is a, a no brainer. The data is there. I still can't change it now but do we want to wait? Does it make sense in waiting? And then we will re, you know, re, you know, re, uh, redo the appraisal at that time, maybe even taking comparables out because now the new comparables might be bottom line better in every aspect. And mm -hmm. so, yes, we're, you know, like I said, we don't, it, and I should go back to when I say, I shouldn't say for sure, pendings don't matter, they do. You know, it, it, some of this stuff gets kind of complex on how to explain it, but, you know, it's, it's bracketing. So if, if we say our house is sold at 500 and the appraisal is coming at 475, but I have 500, $520,000 sales, which are adjusting down and I have 450 adjusting up. Well, we know that, Hey, there's something kind of similar at 520. But yet I don't, I don't have any kind of a balance to get it to that point. But these two pendings over here or three pendings properly disclosed could play a role in the appraised value because I can choose, I can, what it's called a reconciliation of value. If I have six comparables and they all come up with a different adjusted price, I have to decide between those six, where is our price? Is it on the low end? Or is it on the high end? Well, gal darn, I'm going to most likely, if I've got pendings in my pocket, I'm going to take my reconciliation of value, that range of value that all the adjustments are on each comparable, I'm going to wait towards the upper end because we know we're going up. So that's how pendings can play a role. But if, if my highest selling comp was 520 and the sale of our house was 550, 
the comparables aren't going to, or the, the pendings aren't going to get us there. But that's the whole thing about balancing this report. If, again, if we have a house that we have hundreds of pieces of data for, and they max out at 500, and we have that one that sold at 550, we have probably way too much evidence to say it's not going to appraise. Everything like it never, never exceeded 500 ever historically. Um, pendings might suggest it. That might be something where, hey, can we wait? Can we wait for those pendings? And again, that just takes a little bit extra effort on the appraiser. Um, if we can, if, if I would not advise anybody to wait, if we don't know what those pending prices are, if we, if with if, if that information is not shared, you know, because four hundred fifty thousand dollar list price in this market is meaningless to everybody. We don't know what really did that thing sell for. But if the agents are willing to give it the set information, there are ways that that can play a role. It's just that if the, if these numbers are like thirty or forty thousand dollar gaps. That's where I'm not sure if the, the pendings would put you over the top, but smaller gaps can. It, it just allows the appraiser to, if, if they're good comps, to st go stay within that range that they are stuck with staying in, but go to the upper level Got for it. timing of the market, but not exceeding that. So if your highest comp sold adjusted out at 500 grand, you really can't produce an appraisal that is more than 500 grand because you didn't demonstrate anything that it's worth over 500. So again, that might get too much into the weeds, but. No, I, I think it's just, it's also one of those things if we've got a longer escrow period or a longer close period, it's something for us to pay attention to. So agents, a couple of things. When you guys have a 60 day close, please don't put a commitment or a final commitment date in uh, 30 days prior, because then I'm stuck. Okay, because if you have that window of time and you say you want a final commitment two weeks prior of your 60 day close, it gives us a little bit more wiggle room. But if I've got to do a final commitment and I've got to clear out the appraisal, it's very, very hard for us to come back and go, oops, we were just kidding. I know we already reviewed this, underwrote it and did everything on the appraisal. Now let's take another glance at this. There, it, It's just you want to put your best foot forward the first time around. Okay. Um, okay. Who has other questions? I feel like I'm monopolizing because I have all these questions for Steve, but um, who else has questions? Otherwise I will ask. Go ahead, Jade. Have you ever heard of or dealt with yourself doing an appraisal and one of the comparables was actually an active? Because I, I, I didn't think that was a thing, but that actually happened to me with a duplex in St. Paul. So I was wondering if maybe you had any light to shed on if that happens. So your the question is on the, the active was used as a comparable? There was an active that was used as a comparable. Yeah, we had one, one, two sold and then one active. And we were all perplexed. Like we were just, it was really shocking because everything we've ever heard was that it has to be a sold. Yeah, and it can be a comparable. It, it, and, and especially in an inflationary time, yeah, there might be reasons to put it in there as a comparable. It's just usually those first three comparables, kind of like that's, I, it's, it's skirting the issue a little bit, but some lenders will allow that. Do you know if that was a, a traditional lender or was that more like a, a, like a local bank that was doing the financing on it? It was Bell Bank. Okay, see, they might, they might, be doing that for a portfolio loan too, where they're just keeping it in house. So there is some of that, but yeah, that a lot of lenders won't like that because it, it, it's, it's not giving a, a full, a full feel, but knowing duplex market, there's not a lot of them. They, they don't hit the MLS system. Um, so yeah, it, it's not a good habit because it, you're, you're relying way too much on two properties and could be putting you too far low or, or, or too high. But in some situations that is allowed, um, mm -hmm. it, but it does come to lender to lender. To lender. Okay. So, Most of them would not allow it. The typical so lending and forming loans probably would not allow it. But I would say- Is there a requirement, Steve, of we want three comparables 
and five total comparables, two of which can be active or, or pending. So is what there was the any first? I didn't hear the first part. What was the question? Is, is there any, so, and, and I probably could look at our own rules. I don't know our own rules, but are there, I've always seen where there's at least three sold comparables and usually they go in order of what is the most like, you know, the first comp is really your best comp, second and third. And then there might be two other pendings or something like that to kind of justify Sometimes you'll get a whole bunch, but what is the minimum? Uh, am I hearing you say on this one, two is the minimum or in general, three is the minimum and then they can go to pendings and or actives? Yeah, most likely you want to get three, okay. three properties. Now, the other thing, like on that duplex example, I know it exists out there. I've never, ever done one doing that because I don't, I don't really know if we're doing anybody any justice on that. Um, unless that was such a weird comp or a weird property that that is only the only properties, but it does happen where let's say we use at least three comparables. We don't have to provide equal weight. We just have to figure out, I have three comp number one. I'm going to put 50% weight on that. Well, you know, comp number three is really bad, maybe 10%. And this is the reconciliation. This is how we can do it. And I think in a sense, what that appraiser did on that duplex Two comparables, and I don't know, did they put 50% on each? I don't know, because you don't have a third one. So it, it, it's just the, the, the process of um, reconciliation. Again, where do you bring that value in and why? Comparables that have the biggest adjustments are usually the most dissimilar. And by theory, those would be the lower quality adjustments or the lower quality comps. They should be weighted less. The ones that have the least amount of adjustments most likely are the most similar. They should be weighted more. And so, you know, your, your weight has to add up to 100%. So, you know, two comparables, uh, dividing the difference 50%, not a, not a, you, you'd much rather be able to support and have more of a balance because I guarantee you there's something about two comparables that the whole process, there's not everything is bracketed in there. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure why that would have ever been done, but I, it does exist. Yeah, this one was really interesting. It kind of opened my eyes a lot just because there were some souls that, so the duplex was in Frogtown and it was more on like the side of Frogtown near Como. And so okay. like Lexington was maybe a block away from this duplex. And then this particular square, there weren't a whole lot of duplexes the listing agent was also using some on literally the other side of Lexington, like just right across the street. And when we were talking about that being a possibility, the appraiser just said, no, it's far too different. And so then I was like, oh my God, like, so instead of, we can't, we can't use it because it's far too different. So he's justifying using an active. It was just really interesting. I wanted to yeah, share. No, the, the question is, is far too different as that because it was location? Or is the, the, the property, like if we have one bedroom duplexes and maybe that one kitty corner across the street had four bedroom units. Well, right there probably is not the same buyer. So there, there might be something different here. No, but in, in, in your question threw me off that actually somebody would do that. But the other part, the other reason that that probably was acceptable is there's another form of value in your duplex appraisal and it was the income approach. And the appraiser might have been putting more weight on the income approach. So the, the three, three approaches, the value, the income, the sales comparison, and the cost. If we're not dealing with a new house, the cost is pretty much meaningless. And it's meaningless on a 100-year-old duplex. It doesn't matter. So we're not doing that. But we're doing the sales comparison approach. We're doing the income approach. I could see the argument that I have a bunch of sales or uh, rent data to tell me that this duplex will be this value because of its income. Somebody's buying the income stream. The sales comparison stinks. The comparables aren't good. The rent comparables are good, but the sales comparables are not. And there now, now you have to reconcile between sales comparison and income. And I could see that the income probably was the biggest emphasis in that appraisal it should have been with using only two sales so mm -hmm. that was a good sometimes you, you, you that was a very good question because it was what the 
what what the reasoning with that two comparables would be but that might be what it was is that the the um the rent the income approach is what really was taking the weight on that particular assignment okay hmm. jesse did you have a question <laughs> Yeah, I've got a question. So uh, I'll just use the area that I live in, in particular. I live on a Medicine Lake. There's a lot of homes that sell off market. Yes. Um, do appraisers. So they're not obviously not pulling that information because I have a few friends out here that have refinanced and have received very, very low appraisals that don't justify current solds and off markets that it seems like they're really just taking a most recent MLS solds. Yep. So I obviously now they all call me and say, can you pull all that information from the houses that have sold and can we give that to the appraiser? How do they take into consideration those properties? Am I bringing it to their attention? Is it helping them? Yes, it, it should be able to help them a little bit. It depends on what form this information is in. Um, the appraiser would have to go to county records and confirm that, hey, we know that it's sold on this date and for this much. But the difficulty in using those kind of things is at least the MLS system and by all the rules and regulations we have to follow when we're putting listings in, the information is deemed reliable. Um, and, and I think as a our system, we all do pretty good putting that information in. Now the question is, is the off-market stuff. Sure, I can confirm that that property sold at this. I might be able to confirm some concessions if there were concessions, but that's not even for sure. But then the question is, is how do we get that information about the square footage, the condition, how old that kitchen was, when was it renovated, um, you know, was this a $20,000 kitchen? Was it a $200,000 kitchen? When were the baths done? The roofs, the siding, the windows, the furnace, you know, the condition of it, um, the, the layout of it. We, we're blind because we have no pictures. We've been accustomed to pictures. Used to be, again, I've been doing this 28 years. It used to have one picture of the front of the house, and that was it. But today's world with all these pictures are fabulous. It makes appraising much more reliable and supportable. But when we don't have that, yeah, this house sold at a million dollars on Medicine Lake. I can confirm that, but the rest of it, I can't confirm. I mean, the, the, the county records aren't always great in trying to figure out the square footage if they're accurate. Um, so that's unreliable. But again, it's, it's again, the layout of the house, the floor plan, none of that stuff is known by the appraiser. Now, if it's something that sold off the market but the agent had there's an agent involved and there was a bunch of pictures yeah if i can get all this information i'd hold out hope that i we could use it um this is the same question that kind of goes to the 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 duplex and this is duplexes are notorious in this market kind of a ghost market that these sales exist they aren't selling through the mls and that makes it inherently exponentially harder to appraise when the data, when you're taking a large percentage of that data and not putting them, putting them out there. Um, I've seen, you know, the comps sold being put into the MLS too. And those can work if the information, again, is populated. Sometimes it's just an address and a selling price. Um, so the, the, we, we've got to be able to be comfortable with that information. And where did that information come from? Um, we got to make sure it didn't come from the homeowner. Um, because we have to, we have to cite our sources about the information and, 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 uh, confirm that through a secondary source. Well, we can confirm the selling price and the selling date through a secondary source, but a lot of the other information is sometimes mostly verbal in those kind of situations. So yes, I mean, they, they can be played a role, but not always easy um, it takes a lot of homework on everybody's part to try to track that information down. Can they use me as reference in terms of me giving them that information and then me knowing that most of these people are over my neighbors and I've been in their houses and know what the houses I, are? If, if we don't have, if, uh, if it were me, <laughs> I would explore the option, yes. 
Okay. And, you know, I, because you're a, you're a licensed agent and I can disclose that this is where the information came from. Um, I, I based it on the, on the pictures um, and a firsthand knowledge of somebody being in the house. Um, so it's still a very subjective about condition. Your condition, my condition are different. That's why whenever I talk to agents about this, hey, can you tell me something about the kitchen? You know, 1950s home. Well, geez, you know, if they just put a brand new kitchen in, that could be 20000 or it could be $200,000. So we need, to, we need to track down that information. But in theory, yeah, it, 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 it might, be, might be helpful, you know, maybe even as a pending or not a pending, but as, a, as, a, as another additional comp, maybe a fourth comp. Um, cause maybe I can produce the appraisal in a manner that I just need one more piece of information. And that comp that you provided me might be that one. Yeah. Throw it into the appraisal. It might, it might help, um, bracket one more, something. One more quick question on that. Why would people, why do they not, like if it's a, a sale that happens pre-market, why would agents not put it on the, the MLS? And maybe some guys, you guys can answer this for me. Is it a privacy thing? Is it a um, effort thing? What what is it? So some of these houses, like in my area, they the homeowners sell them to uh, people that are looking because it's so highly sought after now that we get a, I get a letter probably three letters a week for people looking for homes. So it's selling uh, buyer to seller no agents involved okay. using a uh, either an attorney or it's an agent, a friend of the family that's do, facilitating it and isn't collecting any money. So they're not putting that information on the MLS. Got it. Okay. Okay. That was my own question. And see, like with, when it's on the MLS, we could even get to those seller disclosures, which tells us a lot about the house. And when they're not hitting the MLS, the information is just so sparse that it, it could work or may not work. And, and anybody that's putting out these, the houses that sell that we're going to be on the market, but they just sold early. Yeah. Throw those into the comp solds, but then populate the information in there. Maybe even with pictures, if there's agents, obviously agents involved. Yeah. Have the listing agent put that information. It's one in these inflationary times. It's another piece of data that we can help populate it. It's kind of helpful to have them there, but if there's no information in them, it, 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 we just have to kind of, it, you end up kind of going right past them. But the more information, the better. Okay. You guys, we have about two minutes left or so. So are there any last questions that you want to ask of Steve at this moment or any other questions you want to grab from him quick? Hi, Steve. So if I have an appraisal, well, let me back up. I have clients who purchased a condo a little over a year ago and okay. they just listed and sold. I still have their appraisal report from when they purchased. And the reason I'm, I'm nervous about their appraisal is in between when they bought and now when they're selling. So just a couple months ago, a unit in the building sold for about 20 grand less and I'm, I'm worried about it and we've had the conversation. I want to be able to provide the appraiser helpful information. Does that previous appraisal report have any weight? Is that gonna help us? Or does the comp that sold in September really, really pull our value down? Well, I don't see that it would hurt you. Um, now, some appraisers have an opinion that they don't wanna to talk to any human beings. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't want to be influenced in any way. You know, when I sign my name to an appraisal, I'm, I'm, I'm signing my name and certifying that I have not been an influence, but it's, and sometimes appraisers misunderstand what that means. It means Lisa hasn't influenced me. The lender did not tell me to do this or do that or do, no, I've been, done this, done this completely independently. Sometimes appraisers might think that that's, you know, free from influence from the agent. And that's not, that's not true. The agent is the agent. They're a salesperson. Um, I would expect that. I wouldn't expect anything other. Um, so yeah, I, it, it, it's a problematic thing. If you can, in, in the meantime, find out if there was something about that sale, 
if you can do I, your due diligence and then let the appraiser know, hey, those people did sold because this, this, and this. And there was because they want to get out of the city because you know something that would cause them to act really quickly and maybe take a lesser price than yes. yeah, well, I, I do have that information so i know that it was a bad breakup and the seller moved out of state and needed to get get out so that will help well you know the, the reasons that people move are very much similar it's it's divorce it's relocation but it, it's one of those things you don't really know until we know um, if somebody tells me that, hey, if, if, if you told me some information about that sale, about that it really doesn't reflect market value, then yeah, I am going to that particular comparable because you're right. That's going to be a tough one to get over if the fact that it exists in that building and it's the most recent um, doesn't mean for sure it will be used. Most likely it would. But through my due diligence, if I'm talking to the agents and there was some reason that I'm not going to use it. I don't have to use it, but I better have a good reason. Um, and not that just that it sold for 20 grand lower than our previous appraisal. Um, you know, because the other part of this is downward trending markets. There are some neighborhoods that are not increasing um, either at the same rate or they may be going down. And so we do have to kind of be careful with those condos. You know, I don't know if there's, if, if that one sale is a sign that, there's a, a trend. One sale does not make the trend. Um, but uh, sorry, um, it, it, it is something to see if you do your due diligence ahead of time on that, on that comp. And if you can talk to the agent and find out some information, and if you feel it's valuable, then let the appraiser know. And like I say, you know, the, the, the previous appraisal, it's, you know, when I'm provided a previous appraisal to I'm not really looking at the, the previous value per se. You know, that's kind of what I'm tasked to do to come up with. I may be looking in the narrative part of the appraisal. Hey, did I did I view this house the same way somebody else did? Um, uh, and and what comparables were used? Oh, you know, if and if all your if your if your appraisal uses comparables all from the building, okay, well then we have a bunch of comparables, including the your own sale. Then, then this one, this one recent sale sticks out as an aberration to the market. Um, mm -hmm. So that might be a reason not to use it. But we'd have to be very careful to just to, to throw it out to say for sure that's cheaper than everything else. We have to make and this is where pendings and listings would play a role. If that thing sold for twenty thousand dollars less, now I'm looking at the listings and the pendings in that same building, and where are they priced? If they're twenty. If they're twenty thousand dollars higher or up by your price, well, that tells me something. But if they're down at the price where this other one was, that's telling me something different. So that's again where where pendings and listings play a role. It's especially when things are so similar, like condos. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, guys, we are at the top of the hour, so I want to wrap this up. So. Um, really, really quick before you guys go, I want to make sure not to slight Steve, but people ask me all the time on waivers. Can we get an appraisal waiver on this? It is not something I grant with my magic wand. There, are, There's lots of things that go into it. So um, you will never get an appraisal waiver on a duplex, triplex, or fourplex. Please don't ask, okay? Um, on a single family when you're purchasing, 20% down, not 5%, 3%, 15 no. 20% down only. Uh, you will get it on a 10% down if you're doing a rate and term refinance. Okay. So if you've got clients, we got waivers um, on a 10%. It does not mean the same as a refinance or as a purchase, excuse me. Um, and currently for us, oh, also condos. Condos will follow. If you have a condo at 20% down owner occupied, you have the option to get a waiver. Okay. Um, for us, we just put something out yesterday that said no second home waivers and no investment property waivers. That's an us thing. So I don't know if we're reading the market and seeing something happening there and we're just ahead of the game. But in general, there are waivers for those properties if you have like a 50% loan to value, but they are no longer waivers for us on uh, second homes or investment properties. Um, okay. You guys, thank you very much for jumping on here. Steve, thank you so much. Your information is always very 
um, detailed. And I feel like we under, at least I can understand it because there's a lot more thought, I think, that goes into the appraisal than any of us realize. And it's not just a like, do, 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 a bring value. There's a lot of work that goes, goes into it. And if anything, I think they definitely saw that today. So thank you for your time. I much appreciate it. Guys, if there is anything else that you need from us, anything extra we can do, um, please let us know. And keep in mind, the appraisal process right now is uber important. So to have people like Steve and those people that are really good at what they do um, on our panel is massively a benefit to you guys. So, okay. Thanks for uh, jumping on, guys. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you.